In the same spirit as the modern worker in science, who gropes onward and dreams of discovering a cure for a terminal disease, the ambition of the medieval alchemists was to pull back the curtain of the unknown to reveal truth of extending life. The majority of these charlatans had two fixed objects in view as the goals of their ambition, one being the discovery of some body that would be capable of transmuting the baser metals into gold and silver. The other was the discovery of an elixir, which would prolong the span of human life to an indefinite period. The ancient workers in alchemy believed that all natural things were composed of four elements which they termed fire, air, earth, and water. When these four elements are conjoined, wrote alchemist and natural philosopher Roger Bacon, they become another thing, whereas it is evident that all things in nature are composed of the set elements being altered and changed. Later, alchemists adopted the notion that all metals were composed of two substances. One was metallic earth and the other a red and flammable matter which they called sulfur. The pure union of these substances formed gold, but other metals were mixed with and contaminated by various foreign ingredients. The object of the philosopher's stone was to dissolve or neutralize all these ingredients, by which iron, lead, copper and all metals would be transmuted into the original gold. Men of undoubted ability and genius wasted both their lives and their fortunes over the search for this elusive chimera and others condescended to fraud and trickery of the meanest description in its pursuit. Two of those who claimed to have located both the elixir and stone were John Dee and Edward Kelly. The men made their living off the credulity of nobility and due to their imposture were frequently just one step ahead of the king's soldiers, the Inquisition or both. By himself, probably neither would have taken the path which they followed together, but combined they reacted like sulfur and quicksilver. Leaving behind a legacy altogether unique in alchemy, Dr. D was altogether a wonderful man. He was born in London in the year 1527 and very early manifested a love for study. At the age of 15, he was sent to Cambridge and delighted so much in his books that he passed regularly 18 hours every day among them. Of the other six, he devoted four to sleep and two for refreshment. Such intense application did not injure his health and did not fail to make him one of the finest scholars of his time. Unfortunately, he quitted mathematics and the pursuits of true philosophy to indulge in the unprofitable reveries of the occult sciences. He studied alchemy, astrology and magic and thereby rendered himself obnoxious to the authorities at Cambridge. By the influence of a friend, he was kindly received at the court of King Edward VI. He continued for several years to practice in London as an astrologer, casting nativities, telling fortunes and pointing out lucky and unlucky days. During the reign of Queen Mary, he was suspected of heresy and also charged with attempting Mary's life by means of enchantments. He was tried for the latter offense and acquitted, but was retained in prison on the former charge. He had a very narrow escape from being burned in Smithfield, but he contrived to persuade the powers of the church that his orthodoxy was unimpeachable. He was set at liberty in 1555 on the accession of Elizabeth. A brighter day dawned upon him. Her servants appear to have consulted him as to the time of Mary's death, which no doubt first gave rise to the serious charge for which he was brought to trial. They soon came to consult him more openly as to the fortunes of their mistress and Robert Dudley, the celebrated Earl of Leicester, was sent by command of the Queen herself to know the most auspicious day for her coronation. Astrology was the means whereby he lived, and he continued to practice it with great assiduity, but his heart was in alchemy. The philosopher's stone and the elixir of life haunted his daily thoughts and his nightly dreams. His studies impressed him with the belief that he might hold discourse with spirits and angels and learn from them all the mysteries of the universe. He imagined that by means of the philosopher's stone, he could summon these kindly spirits at his will. By a dint of continually brooding upon the subject, his imagination became so diseased that he at last persuaded himself that an angel appeared to him and promised to be his friend and companion as long as he lived. He relates that one day in November 1582, while he was engaged in fervent prayer, the window of his room looking towards the west suddenly glowed with a dazzling light, in the midst of which in all his glory stood the great angel Uriel. Awe and wonder rendered him speechless, but the angel, smiling graciously upon him, 
gave him a crystal of a convex form. Curiel told him that whenever he wished to hold conversation with the beings of another sphere, he had only to gaze intently upon it, and they would appear in the crystal and unveil to him all the secrets of futurity. This said, the angel disappeared. D found from experience of the crystal that it was necessary that all the faculties of the soul should be concentrated upon it, otherwise the spirits did not appear. He also found that he could never recollect the conversations he had with the angels. He therefore determined to communicate the secret to another person who might converse with the spirits while he, D, sat in another part of the room and took down and writing the revelations which they made. He had at this time in his service as his assistant, one Edward Kelly, who was just as crazy upon the subject of the Philosopher's Stone. There was this difference, however, between them. While Dee was more of an enthusiast than an imposter, Kelly was more of an imposter than an enthusiast. Kelly was just the man to carry on any piece of votary for his own advantage, or to nurture the delusions of his master for the same purpose. No sooner did Dee inform him of the visit he had received from the glorious Uriel, then Kelly expressed such a fervor of belief that Dee's heart glowed with delight. He set about consulting his Christel forthwith, and on the twend of December 1581, the spirits appeared and held a very extraordinary discourse with Kelly, which Dee took down in writing. The later consultations were published in a folio volume in 1659, under the title of a true and faithful relation of what passed between Dr. John D. and some spirits, tending, had it succeeded, to a general alteration of most states and kingdoms in the world. The fame of these wondrous colloquies soon spread over the country and even reached the continent. D., at the same time, pretended to be in possession of the elixir vitae, which he stated he had found among the ruins of the abbey at Glastonbury. People flocked from far and near to his house at Mortlake to have their nativities cast in preference to visiting astrologers of less renown. They also longed to see a man who, according to his own account, would never die. He carried on a very profitable trade, but spent so much in medicines and medals to work out some peculiar process of transmutation that he never became rich. About this time, there came into England a wealthy nobleman named Albert Lasky, Count Palatine of Syrids, near Krakow. His object was principally to visit the court of Queen Elizabeth, the fame of whose glory and magnificence had reached him among the distant Poles. Elizabeth received this flattering stranger with the most splendid hospitality and appointed her favorite Leicester to show him all that was worth seeing in England. He visited Oxford and Cambridge that he might converse with some of the great scholars whose writings shed luster upon the land of their birth. He was very much disappointed at not finding Dr. D among them and told the Earl of Leicester that he would not have gone if he had known that D was not there. A few days afterwards, the Earl and Count being in the antechamber of the Queen, awaiting an audience of Her Majesty. Dr. D arrived on the same errand and was introduced to the Pole. An interesting conversation ensued, which ended by the stranger inviting himself to dine with the astrologer at his house at Mortlake. D returned home in some distress, for he found he had not money enough to entertain Count Lasky and his retinue in a manner becoming their dignity. In this emergency, he sent off an express to the Earl of Leicester, stating frankly the embarrassment he labored under and praying his good offices in representing the matter to Her Majesty. Elizabeth immediately sent him a present of 20 pounds. On the appointed day, Count Lasky came attended by a numerous retinue and expressed such open and warm admiration of the wonderful attainments of his host that D turned over in his mind how he could bind irretrievably to his interests a man who seemed so well inclined to become his friend. Long acquaintance with Kelly had imbued him with all the roguery of that personage, and he resolved to make the Pole pay dearly for his dinner. He found out that he possessed great estates in his own country, but that an extravagant disposition had reduced him to temporary embarrassment. D also discovered that the Count was a firm believer in the Philosopher's Stone and the Water of Life. He was, therefore, just the man upon whom an adventurer might fasten himself. Kelly thought so too, and both of them set to work to weave a web in the meshes of which they might firmly entangle the rich and credulous stranger. They went very cautiously about it, first throwing out obscure hints of the stone and the elixir. 
and finally of the spirits. Lasky eagerly implored that he might be admitted to one of their mysterious interviews with Uriel and the angels. To the Count's entreaties, they only replied by hints of the difficulty or impropriety of summoning the spirits in the presence of a stranger or of one who might have no other motive than the gratification of a vain curiosity. But they only meant to wet the edge of his appetite by this delay and would have been sorry indeed if the Count had been discouraged. They lured on the pole from day to day and at last persuaded him to be a witness of their mysteries. Whether they played off any optical delusions upon him or whether by the force of a strong imagination he deluded himself does not appear. But certain it is that he became a complete tool in their hands and consented to do whatever they wished him. At these interviews, Kelly placed himself at a certain distance from the wondrous crystal and gazed intently upon it, while Dee took his place in a corner, ready to set down the prophecies as they were uttered by the spirits. In this manner they prophesied to the Pole that he should become the fortunate possessor of the Philosopher's Stone, that he should live for centuries and be chosen King of Poland, in which capacity he should gain many great victories over the Saracens and make his name illustrious over all the earth. For this, it was necessary that Lasky should leave England and take them with him together with their wives and families. The spirits told the Count that he should treat them all sumptuously and allow them to want for nothing. Lasky at once consented, and very shortly afterwards, they were all on the road to Poland. It was not till ruin stared him in the face that he awoke from his dream of infatuation. Thus restored to his senses, his first thought was how to rid himself of his expensive visitors. Not wishing to quarrel with them, he proposed that they should proceed to Prague, well furnished with letters of recommendation to the Emperor Rudolf. The alchemists, too, plainly saw that nothing more was to be made of the almost destitute Count Lasky. Without hesitation, they accepted the proposal and set out forthwith to the imperial residence. They had no difficulty in obtaining an audience of the emperor. They found him willing enough to believe that such a thing as the Philosopher's Stone existed. But from some cause or other, the emperor conceived no very high opinion of their abilities. He gave orders that they should quit his dominions within 24 hours. Not knowing well where to direct their steps, they resolved to return to Krakow, where they had still a few friends, but the funds they had drawn from Lasky were almost exhausted. They had great difficulty to keep their poverty a secret from the world. They still gained a little by casting nativities and kept starvation at arm's length, till a new dupe rich enough for their purposes dropped into their toils in the shape of a royal personage. Having procured an introduction to Stephen, King of Poland, they predicted to him that the Emperor Rudolf would shortly be assassinated and that the Germans would look to Poland for his successor. As this prediction was not precise enough to satisfy the king, they tried their crystal again. A spirit appeared, who told them that the new sovereign of Germany would be Stephen of Poland. Stephen was credulous enough to believe them and was once present when Kelly held his mystic conversations with the shadows of his crystal, he also appears to have furnished them with money to carry on their experiments in alchemy. But he grew tired of their broken promises and their constant drains upon his pocket. He was on the point of discarding them with disgrace when they met with another dupe to whom they eagerly transferred their services. This was Count Rosenberg, a nobleman of large estates in Bohemia. So comfortable did they find themselves in the palace of this munificent patron that they remained nearly four years with him faring sumptuously and having an almost unlimited command of his money. The Count was more ambitious than avaricious. He had wealth enough and did not care for the Philosopher's Stone on account of the gold, but of the length of days it would bring him. Accordingly, they had their predictions already framed to suit his character. They prophesied that he should be chosen King of Poland and promised that he should live for 500 years provided always that he found them sufficient money to carry on their experiments. But now, while fortune smiled upon them, retributive justice came upon them in a shape they had not anticipated. Jealousy and mistrust sprang up between the two confederates and led to such violent and frequent quarrels that D was in constant fear of exposure. Kelly imagined himself a much greater personage than Dee and was displeased that on all occasions and from all persons, Dee received the greater share of honor and consideration. 
he often threatened to leave Dee to shift for himself. The latter, who had degenerated into the mere tool of his more daring associate, was distressed beyond measure at the prospect of his desertion. His mind was so deeply imbued with superstition that he believed the rhapsodies of Kelly to be derived from his discussions with angels, and he knew not where in the whole world to look for a man of depth and wisdom enough to succeed him. As their quarrels every day became more and more frequent, Dee wrote letters to Queen Elizabeth to secure a favorable reception on his return to England, whither he intended to proceed if Kelly forsook him. While thus preparing for the worst, his chief desire was to remain in Bohemia with Count Rosenberg, who treated him well and reposed much confidence in him. Neither had Kelly any great objection to remain, but a new passion had taken possession of his breast, and he was laying deep schemes to gratify it. His own wife was unattractive and ill-natured. Dyes was calmly and agreeable, and he longed to make an exchange of partners without exciting the jealousy or shocking the morality of D. This was a difficult matter, but to a man like Kelly, the difficulty was not insurmountable. The next time they consulted the spirits, Kelly pretended to be shocked at their language and refused to tell what they had said. D insisted and was informed that they were henceforth to have their wives in common. D, a little startled, inquired whether the spirits might not mean that they were to live in common harmony and goodwill. Kelly tried again with apparent reluctance and said, the spirits insisted upon the literal interpretation. The poor fanatic resigned himself to their will, but it suited Kelly's purpose to appear coy a little longer. He declared that the spirits must be spirits, not of good but of evil, and refused to consult them any more. He thereupon took his departure, saying that he would never return. De thus left to himself was in sore trouble and distress of mind. He knew not on whom to fix as the successor to Kelly for consulting the spirits, but at last chose his son, Arthur, a boy of eight years of age. He consecrated him to this service with great ceremony and impressed upon the child's mind the dignified and awful nature of the duties he was called upon to perform. But the poor boy had neither the imagination, the faith, nor the artifice of Kelly. D was in despair. The deception had been carried on so long that he was never so happy as when he fancied he was holding conversation with superior beings, and he cursed the day that had put estrangement between him and his dear friend Kelly. This was exactly what Kelly had foreseen, and when he thought the doctor had grieved sufficiently for his absence, he returned unexpectedly and entered the room where the little Arthur was in vain endeavoring to distinguish something in the crystal. D wrote that Kelly immediately saw the spirits, which had remained invisible to little Arthur. One of these spirits reiterated the previous command that they should have their wives in common. Kelly bowed his head and submitted, and D, in all humility, consented to the arrangement. In this manner they continued to live for three or four months, when new quarrels breaking out, they separated once more. This time, their separation was final. Kelly, taking the elixir which they had found in Glastonbury Abbey, proceeded to Prague. Forgetful of the abrupt mode in which he had previously been expelled from that city, almost immediately after his arrival, he was seized by order of the Emperor Rudolf and thrown into prison. He was released after some months' confinement and continued for five years to lead a vagabond life in Germany, telling fortunes at one place and pretending to make gold at another. He was a second time thrown into prison on a charge of heresy and sorcery, and he then resolved if ever he obtained his liberty to return to England. He soon discovered that there was no prospect of this and that his imprisonment was likely to be for life. He twisted his bedclothes into a rope one stormy night in February 1595 and let himself down from the window of his dungeon, situated at the top of a very high tower. Being a large man, the rope gave way and he was precipitated to the ground. He broke two of his ribs and both his legs and was otherwise so much injured that he expired a few days afterwards. D, for a while, had more prosperous fortune. He was rewarded, soon after Kelly had left him, with an invitation to return to England. On his arrival in England, he had an audience of the Queen, who received him kindly and gave orders that he should not be molested in his pursuits of chemistry and philosophy. Elizabeth reasoned that a man who boasted of the power to turn baser metals into gold could not be in want of money. 
She therefore gave him no more substantial marks of her approbation than her countenance and protection. Thrown thus unexpectedly upon his own resources, Dee began in earnest the search for the philosopher's stone. He worked incessantly among his furnaces, retorts and crucibles, and almost poisoned himself with deleterious fumes. He also consulted his miraculous crystal, but the spirits appeared not to him. The crystal had lost its power since the departure of its high priest. From this quarter, Dee could get no information on the stone or elixir, and all his efforts to discover them by other means were not only fruitless, but expensive. He was soon reduced to great distress and wrote piteous letters to the Queen praying relief. He finally obtained a small appointment as Chancellor of St. Paul's Cathedral, which he exchanged in 1595 for the presidency of the college at Manchester. He remained in this capacity till 1602, when his strength and intellect beginning to fail him, he was compelled to resign. He retired to his old dwelling at Mortlake, supporting himself as a common fortune teller and being often obliged to sell or pawn his books to procure a dinner. He died in 1608 in the 81st year of his age and was buried at Mortlake. Dr. D was altogether a wonderful man and had he lived in an age when folly and superstition were less rife, he would have left behind him a bright and enduring reputation. Instead, D is mostly known only to those with interests that can be said to border on the eccentric.